how much of a sleep disruptor is caffeine? But caffeine is a misunderstood drug. Certainly, it's everyone, a drug, right? You use the term it drug, is, and that's interesting. It is a drug. Um, it's what we call a psychoactive stimulant. Um, everyone knows that caffeine can help alert you and sort of keep you awake. That's the thing that's most known. Um, caffeine, if you look at some data, is probably the second most traded commodity on the surface of the planet after oil, which I think says everything about our wow. sleep-deprived state. The other thing about caffeine, however, that most people don't realize is the time that it is in your system. So most drugs have what we call a half-life, the amount of time it takes for half of that drug to be essentially excreted out your system. Caffeine has a half-life of about six or seven hours, and it's a little dependent on what type of gene that you have to sort of metabolize the caffeine, but on average, it's about that. But what's interesting is that caffeine has a quarter life of about 12 hours. What this means is that if you have a cup of coffee at noon, a quarter of that caffeine is still circulating around your brain at midnight. Wow. So to put that in context, it would be the equivalent of getting into bed and just before you turn the light out, you swig a quarter of a cup of Starbucks and you hope for a good night of sleep. It, you know, you would never do that because, yeah. you know, but that's exactly, unfortunately, what people do, you know, um, completely innocently by drinking caffeine, you know, still too late in the afternoon. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a huge problem. It, it's, it's a, I, th I think it's a big problem in society. If you, I mean, another way to quantify this is if you just look, and I've checked out the data from the Financial Times, the number of Starbucks coffee houses that have arisen <laughs> over the past 30 years is just like an exponential increase. And I think that is an expression of how we're self-medicating our state of sleep deprivation in developed nations. You, know, you call it a drug. I agree with you. It is a psychoactive substance that we... You know, we, we use liberally. We let our children have it. We, you know, we're not even, you know, we often don't think about the implications of that. And so many patients of mine tell me that, Dr. Chachi, I know, you know, if caffeine can be a problem for some people, I'm not one of those. Caffeine is fine for me. But more often than not, when they either reduce their intake or cut it out completely, the sleep quality goes up. Yeah. And, um, I, and you know, Sachin Panda, um, Professor Panda, who, you know, I know you know very well, you both sort of follow each other's research. He was on the podcast a few weeks ago and, you know, he was saying routinely every year he will he will have a bit of a detox from caffeine. He'll go off caffeine. And he says, when I do that, yeah, I have a headache for a few days, but my sleep always improves. I've got more energy and my productivity dramatically increases. And I think that says it all, really. It does. And, I, you know, a number of points that you made that I'd love to circle back around to. Firstly, caffeine is the only psychoactive stimulant that we do give to our children readily, which, you know, is, I think, a concern. And I'm not trying to be sort of, you know, finger pointing or finger wagging. Again, I think it's just that parents probably don't understand the impact of caffeine in that regard. Um, I think the the second point comes on to your comment of some people say, look, I'm one of those people who can drink a cup of coffee in the evening, have an espresso after dinner and I fall asleep fine and I stay asleep. Now, even if that's true, there was an alarming study that was done where they gave people just one single cup of coffee, a dose of 200 milligrams of caffeine, standard cup of coffee. And then they measured the quality of their deep sleep by tracking these big, powerful brain waves, these glorious, beautiful, deep brain waves that bathe um, uh, all of our brain during deep sleep at night, and it helps also restore the body. And what they found was that just one dose of caffeine in the evening decreased the amount of deep sleep by 20%. Now, you would have to normally age by about 15 years to produce that type of a deficit in your deep sleep, or you can do it every single night by having a cup of coffee. And what's interesting is that those people will wake up the next morning. They won't remember waking up because they may not have woken up, but the quality of their deep sleep was so poor that they will still then feel unrestored and unrefreshed by their sleep. And they need more caffeine. And, and so here is the irony that now they're starting to reach for two cups of coffee rather than one. And so develops this dependency cycle, this sort of addiction spiral, as it were. So I think people are perhaps unaware of the, the true impact of caffeine, how long it sticks around within your system. And even if you feel that you're immune to that evening cup of coffee, how it will still impact your sleep, even though consciously you know nothing about it. Well, I think, you know, you raise a really important point there, Matthew, about 
you know, knowledge and awareness. You know, none of us are pointing fingers. You know, we, you know, I understand caffeine is everywhere. You know, I probably used to over drink caffeine uh, and I've altered my behavior as I've learned more and more about the research. And I think what we're trying to do is raise awareness of, you know, caffeine is a sleep disruptor. There's just no question about that. And, you know, we can dress it up any way we want, but it is a sleep disruptor. So if anyone is listening to this, if that story that Matthew just mentioned resonates with you, I'd really sort of encourage you to have a little think about your caffeine usage and just see if can you, you know, can you wind it down a little bit? Can you see, you know, bit by bit, if by reducing it, it improves your quality of sleep? The recommendation I make in my book is enjoy your caffeine before noon. And I say enjoy because I get it. People love it. Right? I love a good cup of coffee, but I will not have caffeine after midday. Yeah. And I, you know, I've now actually done what Sachin uh, has done. I, I would I routinely go through sort of a caffeine detox. But, you know, I too would enjoy that cup of coffee or a nice strong cup of, you know, um, Yorkshire tea. Uh, I have no relationship with them, by the way, um, in the mornings. And I also love the the coffee culture as well. You know, I go out with friends and we grab coffee all the time. And I love that. And I, I want people to embrace it because I think it's fantastic that there's a social movement sort of circulating around that. Um all I would say, though, is that, you know, decaffeinated coffee is is actually really quite good. And I would struggle, and I'd love to do the sort of, the, you know, the Coke Pepsi challenge with decaf and caffeinated. Just in terms of the taste, you will probably notice that it wouldn't give you sort of the shakes or that sort of slightly anxious state. And you probably know the difference. But I've really become enamored with decaffeinated coffee and wow. all of its flavors. And I love the cafe bar culture. So love to embrace that. But I do like what you're saying uh, about you sort of patients just thinking a little bit about caffeine and considering it and just trying to try the experiment, you know, sort of set yourself the task, give it a go and see if it works for you. Yeah, I, I remember about a month after my book came out, uh, someone tweeted me and said, I, I never, ever thought that caffeine was a problem for me. But I've, I've read your book. I've taken your recommendation. I've, I've how I now only have two cups of coffee and I have it before noon. And I've never slept this well in over 30 years. And it's just incredible how such a common thing that people are doing day to day may be impacting our sleep. And I think you make a really good point that it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more caffeine you drink, the more you need, the more dependent you become, the less good your sleep is. And, and it just continues. I think we also have to highlight, we're talking about coffee, but I think tea yeah. w- would be similar because it contains caffeine. Green tea, you know, a herbal tea that often people switch to when they're not having tea or coffee is also a highly caffeinated drink, so may affect you. You know, as you became more and more aware of all this sleep research, what was the biggest thing in your own lifestyle that you changed on the back of your research? I think it was probably caffeine. Um, I think just seeing the data and then doing those types of studies ourselves and particularly the the finding that we discussed were even if you're asleep, the quality of that sleep is just not as deep. That really got me concerned. And that's when I really started to pay attention to my to my caffeine content. Um, and are you and tea turtle now with caffeine or are you? So right now, yeah, I am. I drink decaffeinated tea and I drink decaffeinated coffee. Um, I sometimes, you know, I've ebbed and flowed between sort of having coffee in the morning um, because I do feel it's it's alerting benefits, but you know we didn't necessarily evolve to be medicated with caffeine. And I think anyone who's you know drinking caffeine at eleven a.m., which on the basis of your circadian rhythm, if you lift, listen to the wonderful podcast with uh, Sachin Panda that you did, you know your peak of your circadian rhythm is right around sort of the eleven o'clock period. That's when it should be almost impossible for you to fall asleep. But yet, you know, I sometimes look around on an airplane when I'm leaving and people, <laughs> half the plane is asleep at 11 o'clock. Yeah. Um, and if you're self-medicating um, your sleep deprivation at 11 a.m. with caffeine, it usually means that you're perhaps just not getting enough sleep. And that's probably been one of the greatest, um, I think, influential factors. That and the impact on my productivity, I think that was the the most underrated. And it actually forced me to start doing a lot of research on sleep loss and productivity that maybe on a second podcast we can well, talk we about. we can get but, into, yeah. But, you know, my ability to re- maintain focus and produce high quality output work is dramatically dependent on the sleep that I've been having at night. That 
absolutely echoes what Professor Panda said a few weeks ago on this podcast. When he goes off caffeine, his productivity goes up. So guys, look, no one's asking you guys to to cut out caffeine. You know, I know how much you guys love it. I have certainly had my own uh, love-hate relation, well, more love of a relationship with, with coffee in the past, but I have dramatically reduced it and I'm feeling better than I've ever felt. If you enjoyed watching that clip, here's another powerful clip that I think you will also really enjoy. The whole idea of reducing sugar by just adding unlimited amounts of these chemicals has to be thought through and we should be weaning people off ultra-sweetened products, which make them more likely, particularly kids, to, to seek sugar.